Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. This is a podcast about culture, communication, personal finance, and personal development. I'm your host, Mo Anderson, and my guest today is former Mrs. India USA, Sunita Sandeep. Sunita is a thought leader who has been actively challenging the cultural fallacy that stress, struggle, and burnout are prerequisites for creativity, happiness, and success. She is also a speaker, technical corporate leader, multi-pageant winner, creative artist, wife, and a mother of two. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya you that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure, my soul is safe. Welcome, Sunita. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. Beautiful introduction. And I'm so honored to be joining here today and discussing some of the most important stuff that's happening out here in our world today, and especially for women. women. Yes, yes, indeed. Grateful to have you here. Let's just get after it. Your website, which I've enjoyed going through and pouring over in preparation for this interview, it states your mission is exploring, exploring, and unleashing human potential using ancient wisdom, scientific healing, and conscious embodiment. What does that mean? And how did you decide on such a bold mission to help others? (laughs) Wow. Yeah. What does it mean? So my own journey that happened and I took in the different parts that I used to heal today as a person Mm -hmm. and then how I take those understanding both from a spiritual standpoint and also from a healing standpoint and take that into a conscious living, a conscious embodiment of that soul and our spirit, how that can be manifested in our human lives in every single role that I'm in, whether as a mom, whether as a professional, whether as a partner, whether as a somebody who's who's going after this kind of a huge mission that I want to uh, handle as a coach or, or anything that I do. And I think that was the missing part for me when I went through deep spiritual training. And I also did a lot of healing on myself, a lot of somatic based healing, mm-hmm. especially for somebody coming from a trauma background, we need to get into the body and then, then use those body level healing practices. But then... <clears throat> I did not know how to get all of these things into my daily living in a way that I can thrive to go beyond just the normal conditioned way of living life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I did see that there is a huge opportunity in interleaving Eastern methodologies with Western practices and take both of them for a contemporary lifestyle, a practical lifestyle in the chaotic world. Great explanation. And I love the uh, gestures and the, <laughs> and the movements that go through it. It's like, it reminds me of uh, Memoirs of a Geisha, how he described how graceful she was. And I also <laughs> speak with my hands and my body, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I hate it when people try but to I'm also me. not to. Yeah, I used to do a lot of theatrical uh, dramas when I was growing up. So Ah. I have a lot of expressiveness that I do with my body, with my face and with my expression. So just an FYI. (laughs) Good to know. Sunita, that was a wonderful explanation of your mission. Thank you for sharing that. You're also a certified trauma support specialist. And I know from our previous conversation and your excellent, excellent TEDx talk that you experienced major trauma firsthand. Please share what you can about that experience, how it impacted you and your work that you're doing now. Yeah, so um, it was a medical intervention trauma that I experienced, and uh, I was told that I had a severe nerve damage, uh, which meant that um, from my elbow down, I was not able to feel anything. I was not able to move anything in my left arm. And the chances of recovery were minimal. And um, 
this happened when I was 25 or 26 years old. And till this point, I was this high achiever, um, the good girl getting A's and getting into the right uh, university, the right job, getting the the right designation, title, working hard and um, almost like an empowered kind of a lady and an empowered kind of a woman that I could do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then when this hit, for a second, I realized, oh, my God, I'm not in control of the life. I have no clue what's going to happen to me. However, the only thing that I have is to surrender to life and respond from that place in a very embracing and accepting way. That's my only choice. Like I don't have any other choice. And then it was more of a forced way of doing things. It's like, you know what, I can't do anything about it. So I have to do this. It was like a a fierce grace that was forced on me to accept and surrender to life and respond to life. However, over the course of years and through spiritual teachings and through my own healing, I realized that that's the only way to live life. If we ever have to feel more connected to ourselves, more connected to the world, um, more at peace with what is happening to us, that's the only way to live. And uh, what trauma did was it opened up an avenue for me. It became the catalyst, a door for me to begin that whole healing process on one side. And on the other side, just exploring who I am. Who am I? Like, what's what's deeper than all of these sufferings or all of these good things or the bad things? What's deeper than all of these positive and negative things? And and I think for me, if that trauma had not happened, I don't think I would have been that serious enough in life to, to go and... Um, discover that aspect of myself because sometimes these things begin because of a suffering um we 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 reach that point of suffering to an extent and then we'll be like this is not the way i want to live life what is the other way to explore and then we we get into a different mode and for me that's how um, I look at trauma as a positive growth. The the growth from trauma, the post-traumatic growth um, can lead to a positive living in life. Well, I'm assuming that it didn't happen that as quickly as it was in the retelling of it. Was there a period, I mean, after being high achieving, which so many of us are because that's what we're taught to do, you know, go after the gold ring, make the A's, get into the best schools, the things you described to go from that to being in that position where there's, there's this loss of control. And I've experienced it as well. This is pretty devastating to suddenly realize your own frailty and humanity and vulnerability, but your mindset shifting or your thoughts about what what you were going through shifting did it happen that immediately or was it weeks no not at all it didn't no it didn't happen immediately it took a lot of suffering uh it's a lot of um um um, frustration and i developed a lot of anxiety panic attacks i was also clinically depressed um i went through my own phase uh, and then i think one day i remember um just falling down on my knees Um, holding my stomach and then saying, I can't do this anymore because there was no hope. And we usually say, you know, don't lose hope, at least have some hope in life to go further. But uh, for me, I was at a point where I even had to let go hope and then face the current moment as it was, that I am going to accept myself with or without the, the 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 nerve coming up, healing up or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that for me opened up what surrender is to the present moment. And surrender is not just like, okay, I'm just good surrendering and I'm not going to do anything about it. It's surrendering to the present moment in a way that you still want to go ahead with life just the way you are. That's surrendering. It's not like completely giving up. It's giving up internally. It's giving up all the struggles and all the resistances that we have internally. 
Mm-hmm. However, how we respond now to the external environment becomes completely different because all the energy that is pent up on resisting life is now freed up. And it also changes how our mind, body, and emotions start behaving. In, in what way? Uh, so so the, the where we are, so this is what I usually talk about acceptance. Where we are at the state of our being is where the thoughts, emotions, and body sensations come in. If we are from a more accepting kind of a beingness, our thoughts, emotions, and feelings are just going to be based on that kind of a being. If we are coming from a being of resisting to life, like I don't want this and this is not the way life has to be, our thoughts are just a reflection of what state of being we are in. Which means instead of struggling to change our thoughts and trying to feel good and trying to have the right feelings and sensations and so on, we need to start shifting our attention to the state of our being. And then naturally your thoughts will be in alignment with that beingness, your emotions and your feelings. That's the shift that that is something that I really want to spread awareness on. It it sounds like it would just be a, a lighten the load as well when internally, because a lot of this is emotional and, and spiritual, even as you, you may be dealing with the trauma externally, but we're compounding it. I, I really I have the concept of just surrendering to it that is just really, really unique. I've only heard one other person talking about it. It was a physician who was, uh, I can't remember, he was diagnosed with with a really difficult disease and had to go through the same thing of of being on the other side of the prescription pad. So uh, it's not a concept we hear enough about. I'm glad you're here to talk about it. Uh, I mentioned your TED Talk, your TEDx Talk earlier, And the title of it is, correct me if I get this wrong, but the title of it is How Trauma, Suffering, and Struggle Can Lead to Positive Change. Yes. And I like that you shared that you didn't immediately have that positive change because I think a lot of people will be like, well, I just, I can't go from this terrible thing that just happened to this positive mindset that's going to be. Yes a process, but how do you begin at the point that you realize that you have to do something different? Um, When I hit the rock bottom and when I surrendered once, for a second, I was able to accept myself just the way I was. And I didn't know what had happened, uh, but for a few days, I felt at calm and at peace within me, and I had no clue what had happened. But then I was like, okay, you know what? There is some place within me, and I don't know how to access that place. I don't know what that place is. And then I think then became uh, began a quest for me to understand. And, and I think something just lights up, and intuitively, we have this feeling that uh, I think I can handle this, or I think there's something within me that's stronger than my mind, or intuitively, we feel that we all have access to that in certain moments. Um, and then it was a journey, Dr. Mo. I went through fibromyalgia, I went through chronic pains, because sometimes when, when, you, when your body contracts, during a trauma and when you go through all of those things, um, it takes a while for the body to relax and our nervous system to relax. And during that mode, for me, it was a journey of uh, severe panic attacks and and, uh, severe insomnia um, that even medications were not putting me to sleep. It was at that level. Um, High amounts of anxiety and panic attacks and Um, chronic pain was so bad, like some days I would just sit and cry. Like I couldn't do anything. It was just pain. Um, And I had two small kids at that point of time. And I was also nursing my uh, younger one. And I was working and and I had to take care of things at home. And 
And it was not something that, okay, you would know that today would be a better day and then you can you can take some medications and, and it'll be at bay and you don't have to worry about it. It was completely, there was no pattern to this pain. One day without me having to do anything, it would be fine. And then suddenly the next day, no matter how much I have worked on it, the pain would just suddenly crop up um, and severe pain. Um, so, so I think the body was storing and because I also come from a high achieving background, we, we have a certain tendency to numb our feelings, to numb our emotions, um, because we want to appear strong and that has helped us, um, to certain extent, maybe till 35, 40, it has really helped us to establish a career, like people pleasing, uh, taking over responsibility of everything, um, all of these patterns, perfectionism, all of these patterns over the course of many years build up in your um, somatic layer, in your body, because we have a tendency, as I said, to suppress emotions, to suppress our feelings. If you're feeling fear, we're like, no, I'm not going to feel fear and I'm going to do what I need to do. You know, that kind of a mentality, we are not vulnerable or we don't show our vulnerability. And over the course of time, for me, the trauma became that doorway, but I see this pattern um, often with so many other women that they store a lot in their body, chronic pain, chronic kind of uh, 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 health issues start showing up, um, a lot of spinal related issues, neck pain, um, spine issues, back okay, pain, yeah. lower back pain. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so it, it starts showing up and it's a very, very common symptom. Yeah, I, I definitely had the neck and the back pain. And they're like, well, you're on the computer too much. I'm like, no, I haven't been on the computer. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, it yeah. won't stop. Yeah, it's just <laughs> not. It's like I'm carrying the weight of the world. You realize in retrospect yeah. that it's all the things you're suppressing, you're describing very well what it feels like to be in that condition. And And yes, we have you know, in African American culture, that strong black woman thing has has worked to yeah. our detriment. Of you yes. know, you're not going to show, don't show any weakness, don't cry, don't flinch, and it it really does wear on you. You can't keep it up. You're right. You can only do it for so long, and then it just becomes overwhelming. One of the things I read as well also that you espouse is that we should stop forcing ourselves to think positive. That, that was interesting <laughs> to me. And it makes you laugh, Ava. So, uh, I mean, for years, we've had all these gurus telling us to think positive and yeah. you're saying we should not. Explain that to me. <laughs> we should not. So let's say if you are starting from a completely neutral layer, there is no negative feelings at all, then try to think positive. So the, the, the my teachings are more catered towards 40 plus women. My teachings are not towards um, somebody who is just starting out their life or like a teenager or so, because there is not much of an emotional baggage, suppression kind of a baggage till we are 35, 40. So what happens when we hit those 35, 40 and a lot of hormonal changes also begin to happen for women at this stage. Right. Now at this point, there is already these negative feelings, stuck emotions that are suppressed and repressed in your body. Mm -hmm. Now, for whatever reason, I'm not feeling good. Then we hear teachings like think positive, be positive, have a positive attitude to life. Now I'll have to force myself to think positive. Mm -hmm. And if I ask 99% of the women when they had negative feelings, did just thinking positive sustain <laughs> in the longer run? It doesn't. And there's a reason for it. It just doesn't sustain. Because what we are doing here, Dr. Mo, is there is a perspective of negative perspective. That's our beingness, right? Like that, that is where we are. Then we force ourselves to take on a new perspective, which is all positive. Everything is good. Everybody is fine. I need to be grateful. I need to forgive everybody. Um, we, we try to take on that. We try to force ourselves. And let's say we try to take our attention there. However, 
all of these parts that are still stuck, suppressed, negative, Mm -hmm. are still there. Nothing has happened to them. You have just taken your attention away from them and you have put your attention to, to a new shiny object. That's all. But then the minute you kind of relax, because then it takes a lot of um, strength and struggle to hold on to these new concepts now, right? The minute you start letting go, you're like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm just going to relax myself. You're just going to fall back into your negative mode of operating. So instead, stop trying to think positive is what I tell them. Instead, go and look at why are you thinking negative as humans as our soul as our spirit as god as consciousness the way we are made is not to be thinking negative and, and have all these suffering kind of emotions for us as a kid as a child we were happy we had immense amount of energy we were fulfilled we had purpose we were not going after and chasing purpose or oh, what is the next purposeful thing that i needed to be doing my mission. We, were, <laughs> we were just happy what we were doing over the course of time what happens we build layers and layers and layers of stuff over it and now we are like okay so this layer is bad i will just do the easy part and maybe think think positive and everything will be fine it just doesn't work that way it, it's not sustaining instead go to those parts and dig deep inquire within discover within why are we feeling negative why are we behaving the way we are behaving why are we perfectionists why are we people pleasers Get to the core of it and don't just get to the know, core of it. Put and icing on an ugly cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, that's all it is. It's an icing on an ugly cake. Um, it's a paint that you put over um like one of my coaches, he says it's like a paint, a nail polish that you put on horse crap. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> It was a kind of a little bit more um, uh, expressiveness there. Yes. Um, but that's what he says. That's what it is. We can try to put as much polish over it. But deep within, if it's not clear, we spend a lot of time. We just get exhausted over time. Um, instead, if you just go dig deep and clear them and release them, you can just be yourself. And Very authentic. Just naturally feel naturally. Good because you're in a good place. That yeah. that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense instead of this artificial happiness and positivity just to make other people happy, really. Is, yeah. Is and, and there is also a word called as toxic positivity, which talks exactly about this or bypassing of emotions. Uh, which is exactly this. Like we just use the next shiny object to feel good for like one or two days, but then we get back and it's not sustaining. Interesting. Like a cardiac bypass. Wow. There's so many gems here. I I really am am excited about what I'm learning here today. What about, what is the difference between addiction to success, which we talked about a little bit earlier, chasing all the shiny things and someone who has high standards or wants to do things as well as possible, or is it the same Beautiful thing? question. Beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Um, <clears throat> is your, so the question to ask is, is your well-being related to those two? Somebody who is addicted to success, their well-being, who they are within their identity is based on success, achievements, getting one thing after the other. Mm-hmm. However, for somebody who has a high standards, that's just their personality type. I just prefer such and so, such a thing. It's just my preference to be that way. However, the result of that is not going to affect their identity or their well-being within. That is the only difference. In fact, 
Um, I, I, I think I went on a podcast and I even said them, it's okay, you don't have to go against being a perfectionist. There's nothing wrong in being a perfectionist. It's one of the expressions that consciousness has. And it's okay. Because at certain points of time, like I, when I'm when I'm trying to do some music work or so, I love to I love to get into that exact notes and get the exact pitch, and I strive a lot to get that. Until mm. it happens to a certain way, I don't feel that the project is complete. However, no matter whether it happens or not, my well-being is not affected. My identity as to whether I'm a good singer, bad singer, good person, bad person is not tied to that. That's all is the difference, Dr. Mo. I got that. Great, great analogy. I'm like that about my writing. I, I can just sit and try to tweak a sentence for, you know, 30, 45 minutes to get it just right if it's a, a critical part. And But at the same time, life will go on. <laughs> if it didn't work out that day or the next day, you know, we'll come back to it. But it, it's not going to change everything about, you know, my mood and, and my goals. So yes. uh, that, that was a really good uh, example. Thank you for that. You mentioned burnout earlier, and and we're getting short on time, but I definitely want to get to this topic of the burnout. Why do you believe there is an epidemic now of of burnout? You you just are seeing it, hearing it everywhere. I'm happy that more people are going for uh, you know mental health and self care, but it it seems to be better than ever. If it's if it's not my imagination or worse than ever, yeah. I should say. Yeah, yeah. I think it initially started with the pandemic and we observed that it's more people in the healthcare who are getting uh, burned out. But later on now, as we see, almost everyone is actually getting burned out, um, even, even in corporate jobs. Uh, even in nine to five jobs, even as an entrepreneur, like people are getting burned out. And for me, what I feel that is, is a kind of do it all, especially for women. We have this do it all kind of a women avatar that we compare ourselves to. Social media, things online, um, articles that we read, books that we read. We just feel that we are somewhere here that do it all women is somewhere here. There is always a gap between where we are and where that do it all women is. Mm -hmm. And the more and more our identity is stuck in this and our happiness is stuck in this, I have to reach here to feel happy. I have to be here um, to do this. Then I think internally, again, the burnout can also be caused by a lot of environmental factors. Um, That's not my area of expertise. I don't go in there at all. For me, the burnout that is caused by the, the within, the inner set of archetypal patterns is what I usually focus on. And for me, one, and then 70, 80% of the women that I work with are not overloaded, but they're overwhelmed overloaded is they have too much going on in their life, too many things to handle. However, if you just walk through and then understand what's happening, how much time they're spending or so, the most of the energy that's spent is actually on the overwhelming part within that's continuously going on and on and on. So if we try to go within and then start Clearing those archetypal patterns, those conditioned patterns, those trauma, trauma can also be causing a lot of overwhelm. All of these things, once we clear it, Mm -hmm. I think we go to the depths of ourselves and we will know whether it's overload, whether it's overwhelm, and then we should be able to take the right decision and then handle it. Navigate it. Yeah, I've I've heard... Someone said, I don't recall who it was, that I'm not overwhelmed, I'm underhelped. Uh, and, you know, that speaks to the, the external part of being able to delegate and get that exactly. balance as well so that you can center yourself and get right again. I want to end uh, our time together, and it's gone so quickly, with a fun question that I know everyone is wondering about after the introduction. You have won multiple pageants. Miss India, (laughs) D.C., Maryland, Virginia, 2021, and Miss India, USA runner-up, 2022, and I'm sure there have been others. 
What do you feel sets you apart as a pageant participant? Whether I, I think it's beyond talent and looks. Is there something about your mindset or competitive spirit or, or what? I, I have no idea. I've never been in a pageant, but what do you feel <laughs> sets you apart <laughs> and makes you distinct? I think for me, yeah, thank you. Beautiful question. I had never thought about it. And and just thinking through it right now as, as you post this question, for me, I think my purpose and my beingness and my calling and my passion is self-expression. And to go on the stage and express myself authentically, whether it's in the question round or whether it's in the introduction round or whether me as a woman, uh, expression in all parts, I think um, that kind of pulled me into the pageantry. And um, yeah, and I love that journey. The love, the journey of going beyond the, um, the comfort zone. Um, especially after having two kids, our bodies have changed. Uh, yeah. Am I comfortable going in my body uh, and, and facing people there and uh, completely going and trying to answer a question that can just suddenly get popped in at me um, with no, and then I have like 30 seconds to answer. Um, it was completely putting myself um, outside the comfort zone and um just doing that, believe it or not, I'm so comfortable at speaking right now, um, answering questions. I think that part of me wanted to come out and pageantry was one door for me. That's a beautiful answer. You said beautiful question. That's a beautiful answer. Tell us about your book, uh, Live to Lead, and the services you provide, please. Yes, um, all details are on my website, www.sunitasandeep.com. There's an ebook that talks a little bit about my journey and also the kind of women that I help and the problems they usually face. Um, there is also a one hour free masterclass on my website um, that talks about my AWAKE program, A W A K E, which is five transformational shifts that I do mental, emotional, somatic, spiritual and at the level of the soul. So all the five parts are um, covered in, in the transformation because I feel, I think as women, it's a holistic approach that we need to take um, uh, to go out into the world. Um, so all details are there. And if somebody is called to work with me, uh, all the details are on my website. They should be able to reach me from there. Very good. We'll drop that in the show notes. She has an amazing website, guys. Lots of uh, great information and, and photos. And yes, the masterclass. I even looked at that. I need to go back and sign, <laughs> sign up for that because I am convinced uh, that you are on to a very good thing here. And uh, so appreciate you, you sharing your time with me today, Sunita. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. And I love what you're doing, the kind of message that you're spreading um, for everybody out there. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I really consider it an honor for me to be here talking to you today. Likewise. And thank you as well for listening and for joining. Remember to click like or subscribe so that you'll be notified of new episodes of Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. And we'll be back next week. Thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group. And I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and reu. Thank you.